All right, the question is, is how do we measure superheat? Well, superheat, when it comes to charging, we're going to be measuring the temperature of the suction line. Plus, we got to know what the suction pressure is. All right, one other thing we got to know, what kind of refrigerant do we have? I'm sticking with R22 right now, and but don't think that we can't do this with any refrigerant. We can. But let's say that we have a system with R22. We look at the evaporator. And again, my art is not the best in the world. But I come in here, and what's going to happen in the evaporator? I have the metering device feeding in the refrigerant. At this point, it's going to be at a saturated state. Let's say that we actually have 40 degrees, and it's at 68 pounds of pressure at this point. At this point, we're looking at a, a, a properly charged system. We still have 40 degrees and 68 pounds of pressure. Okay? The last pass or two, we're going to pick up the superheat. Why do we want superheat? We want vapor. We want vapor going back to that pump. That is a vapor pump. It is not a liquid pump. We talk about what could happen to it. So when it exits the evaporator, we want it to be above the boiling point. Okay? Here we will probably have somewhere around 55 degrees, but what's our pressure going to be? 68. Now, I'm not taking into consideration any loss across the evaporator, pressure loss across the evaporator, but the way we figure this is if we're, we're uh, 15 to 20 degrees above the saturation point, we're guaranteed that we're not going to have any liquid coming back to the compressor. So how do we figure that? We take our pressure, we go to our temperature pressure conversion chart, we figure out what the temperature says it is at boiling, which would be 40 degrees for R22. We take the line, the evaporator line, or in this case, we, we would say we're at the uh, condensing unit, the suction line at the condensing unit, take that temperature, we compare that temperature with our saturation temperature, the difference is the superheat. That, that makes sense? Okay. Alright, if the superheat is too low, what's that indicate? Overcharge. Again, I'm considering that everything else is right. No dirty filters, air flows are proper, okay? We're, we're, we're dealing with the charge alone. Too low of a superheat indicates an overcharge. Too high of a superheat indicates an undercharge. What happens if I'm boiling, all my boiling process is taking place, the latent heat process is taking place too soon in this evaporator, then I'm picking up too much sensible heat. Yes. And what is the ideal amount in degrees of uh, superheat that you'd want to have on that system? 15 to 20 degrees is what I look for. You will see 10 degrees, you will see uh, 15 degrees, but I have found that 15 to 20 degrees works pretty doggone good if I'm measuring at the condensing unit. Okay? Yes. Now, of course, I got two like four, eight, 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 one's a three, one's a two. Right? Well, what's that now? In reference to what you're saying right there, I got two units outside my house, and one's a three, and one's a two. Uh -huh. Should my pressures be the same? Should Talk about tonnage? Uh -huh. Should the pressures be yeah. the same with the change? Yeah, the, the pressures make no difference on the tonnage. Okay, so regardless if I have three ton or two ton, regardless. I'm going to have that same, right? Because both of right. be the same. Right. Uh, tonnage makes no difference. It's just uh, you're moving more gas with a higher tonnage. That's what I'm assuming. Yeah. Like more because yeah, that's uh, the, the, the boiling points don't change. Okay. All right. It's a good question. Uh, <coughs> Repeat what you said, David, about the um, picking up too much heat. Uh, okay. If, talking about uh, sensible heat. Okay. My, the, the, the work that we do with refrigeration is through the latent process. We pick up some heat with the sensible heat process, but 99% of the work is done through the latent heat process, the boiling process, or the condensing process. So if I'm not using all of my coal for that latent, I'm using the rest of it to pick up the sensible heat. So if I've got, say up here, no more liquid 
going past this point. All of it's been used up here. It's all gas, and this gas is picking up sensible heat. That relates to a high superheat. Okay. <coughs> Does that make sense? Uh, I see. If I if I've got that boiling process stopping right down here, and I don't have much more coal to pick up the superheat, then my superheat's going to be low. Okay. Ideally, we would have this much superheat. Unfortunately, our devices today aren't that good that we can uh, ensure that we're not going to get liquid back to the compressor. So we put a little insurance in there to make sure that we don't send liquid back. Okay. You know, I, I see the times coming with some of the electro, uh, electronic devices and all that we'll be able to reduce this superheat to where it's closer to zero. I don't think it will ever be zero because there will be no insurance at all that there would be no liquid. Of course, there are other devices that may come into play. But for right now, we're looking at uh, around about 15 to 20 degrees. By the way, hot day. Temperature is up. Head pressure is up. Is my superheat going to be less or more? All other things equal. She would probably be more. Be less. Right. Higher pressures mean that I'm feeding more refrigerant to the evaporator. Right. Therefore, I'm going to push more refrigerant into the evaporator. Okay. It's going to be less. Right. Okay. So if you go out on a 95 degree day and you, you say, okay, I was here six months ago and this thing had a 15 degree superheat today, it's only got 10. It's not a problem. You're in a different set of, of conditions. Okay. And if you'll look at your temperature and pressure charts on one of the next methods that we're coming up, you'll see that change. Okay? All right. Need to break a little good. It's still good. Okay. One way that you cannot go wrong. Unfortunately, we can't use it all the time. We're down to number two, or up to number two. All right, that's not the way you spell way, is it? Mm -hmm. Put a T on. <laughs> T on the way. Way in. Way in or wait? Mm -hmm. That's be good. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing this is not an English class. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's weigh it in. Well, one problem about weighing it in, what if we already got refrigerant in there? That means we've got to pull all the refrigerant out and weigh it all back in. Well, how much do we know how to weigh in? I mean, how, how do we know how much to weigh in? With a split system, it's a little more difficult. But with a package unit or a self-contained unit, okay, what's that mean? Package unit, everything's in one housing, no refrigerant lines. It's all built right there together. Appliance. Be a good example of water cooler. You don't have refrigerant lines on most uh, uh, external refrigerant lines on most water coolers. A, a, a uh, ice machine. We don't have most ice machines aren't going to have remote condensers on, so it's going to be in that package. It will tell you how much refrigerant to put in that system somewhere on its name line. Okay. The disadvantage is if it's just a little low and I found the leak. Do I want to have to remove all that refrigerant and weigh it back in? Time consuming. What's time? Money. Money. Okay. So there are other methods too, but if I'm changing out a major component and I'm having to remove the refrigerant, my best way to do this is to weigh it back in. Okay, the manufacturer already figured it out for us. We don't have to figure it out. We use their information. All right? Still okay, but, but but say you go to a unit and uh, you've got high superheat. Mm -hmm. That's an indication of low charge. That's an indication of low so charge. So how do you weigh in a, a, a charge? Do you go by um, temperature? Do you use your... Okay, in, in, when, I, when I say weigh in, I would have to remove all the refrigerant out of that system. For, for, a, for a correct... Correct. Correct okay. amount of that doesn't mean I can't reuse the refrigerant that I pulled mm -hmm. out, but I'm probably going to have to add more back to it 
when I, when I put it back in. So the correct way to do it is to pull all the refrigerant out and then reintroduce refrigerant right. with the correct way. That's correct. And I, and, and I don't know of another way because if I take two bottles in here of refrigerant, and I think I've done that in here a little early, and one of them's got 10 pounds in it, the other one's got 30 pounds in it, the pressure's going to be the same. The only way that I actually know how much refrigerant is in that drum is by physically weighing. Okay? The pressure means nothing as far as the weight's concerned. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Like I said, if I'm changing a major component, this is no problem, but if I'm doing a, 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 a uh, add to refrigerant, this can be a problem. Okay? By the way, some of the mini split systems, the only way is to remove that refrigerant and charge it back in with the recommended amount. Because their compressors and all on many of these small high efficiency systems are uh, variable speed compressors. The pressures aren't going to see anything like normal to you. So don't get confused on that. All right? Don't don't be ashamed to say I've got to remove this refrigerant and weigh it back in. That's not a bad procedure at all. Need to take a break? Okay.